afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this special program. Today, historian Sandra Reddish joins us to share the general history of, of Japanese immigrating to the United States and settling in the Great Plains region. We hope to learn more about the overall history, but specifically what life was like during World War II. So I'm going to turn this over to Sandra. Thank you. I uh, guess we'll get started. Yes, title is uh, basically the Japanese uh, Nebraskans in Western Nebraska, basically from 1900 to 1960. Give you an overall general history on it. Uh, slide. Uh, this is the region that we're concentrating on. If you're not familiar, uh, the Panhandle, that's where I'm uh, currently living at, and then the North Platte Valley from North Platte up to the Nebraska-Wyoming border. And this is the area that I was focusing on. And so basically, I'm a native Nebraskan, and, but I never heard about Japanese ever settling out in Western Nebraska, not until 2004. And I was a grad student at K-State at that time. And as I tell people, that's why I wasn't a very good grad student, because I as soon as I heard about the information, I, as soon as time allowed, I took off for a road trip, and that's when I started meeting some of the descendants um, from these first uh, uh, immigrants coming into the valley. And a part of it was also because I was a little perturbed because I had never, this group, the Japanese, were never in any of the Nebraska history books that I was familiar with or read. So. So first off, the one thing that when I first went out there, I had to learn and they had to set me straight because they still refer to it. Issei is that first generation. This is the immigrants that are coming into the United States and into Nebraska. Their children are the Nisei, the second generation. And then their, their grandchildren or the third generation, the Sansei, which is for better lack of terms, think of that as the baby boomers. And then the fourth generation is the Yonsei. So I will be using a lot of the Issei Nisei terms. So. so mainly from my research, the Japanese started coming into the United States in the 1870s. So people have asked, well, why would they do that? It's like any immigrant group, you either, mainly for economic reasons. Uh, things were not going great over in Japan at the time. Um, scarcity, prosperity, peace, that type of thing. And so majority of them, some did go to Hawaii to work in the sugarcane fields. Others uh, started coming in through San Francisco. Later on, as I rode out there to, uh, through Washington State, along, of course, on the West Coast, and then later on going through Canada and Mexico. Um, people, I had, a, I was curious to go, okay, so what, what were these, these, um, uh, immigrants like? Majority of them were single, um, young men. They were usually son number one, two, or I'm sorry, son two or three, because at that time, the oldest son took over the property or the farm or whatever, and there wasn't enough. So basically the young men came over and it's a typical immigrant story. You're gonna go over to America, make your fortune, right? Once you get established, get your money, then you're gonna return back to, the, to the, your home country. And so started going through the research. It was, it was fun. I mean, I actually found some, some photos. And so these are some early ones of them working in ag, and most of the men um, did come from agricultural backgrounds. They weren't uh, coming in from like the Tokyo area. As you can see by, uh, sorry, that's a really good picture uh, of young men uh, with the, I, um, working on, they, they were not, they were gang laborers on the railroad. And so many, 
as I call it, a reversed, instead of go west, young man, you, they went east because as they came into the west coast and either got jobs in the ag field along the west coast or maybe in the fisheries, then they also got jobs on the railroad. And then they were basically helping maintain the lines. And so those were, that's how they went from east from west to east and started going in through the mountain ranges and into the Great Plains. The big thing here, um, the reason I brought this up because this is important because in that region I, that I, in that one slide, because of this Pathfinder Dam, it helped irrigate that North Platte Valley. And that is huge. because it allowed for this crazy crop called sugar beets. And even though I'm a farm kid from the Eastern part of Nebraska, I never knew what a sugar beet was. This is a sugar beet. And when the irrigation, that Pathfinder Dam was completed and they started bringing in the irrigation canals, the soil and the temperature is just perfect for growing sugar beets. It is like this huge, perfect storm for a, a, a great crop, a great money crop. And so they needed laborers because it was incredibly labor intensive to tend these fields. And so they, it started out with the Great Western Sugar Company, which is now it's the Western Sugar Cooperative. And they pretty much owned it and there was sugar mills. If you look at the map there, if you have an interest in that, there were um, refineries in, uh, all, in a lot of those little towns along the North Platte Valley. So that was the railroad brought them in, but it was the um, sugar beets and the irrigation that really boomed for the agricultural part. And so they quit the railroad and they became farm workers. And as you can see from this, from saying the stats from uh, from this author, the huge percentage of the immigrants. So, so it wasn't like learning anything new. They were used to hard work and working with their hands and in the soil. So I know that you probably can't see this very well, but this was an article in the 1913 paper of the Star Herald here in Scotts Bluff, and they did a consensus. And so the Scotts Bluff County was the largest uh, had the most Japanese in the whole state of Nebraska in 1913 for that very reason of them coming into the valley and working. Now, this is, I was really fortunate to find this when I did my research. Uh, this is what, I had no idea what a passport looked like at that time. And so this is from Noe Sato, um, like I said, from 1914. Go ahead. And the reason I bring this up, because if you have these young men in, where are they going to get the wives? And so I would ask asking the women, and so is picture brides. And so basically, they exchange photos. They may not know the person, but you just exchange photos. But it was not one-sided. I was told that you, if you got your photo, you did not have to agree that, yes, you'll be marrying this guy. You did have an option to, to say no, um, but most of the brides were at that time picture brides. They would have come into the coast and the men would have met them there, married, and then they would have then moved with them um, into the valley. The reason I brought that, the other book, The Buddha in the Attic, uh, this is a lovely, lovely book. And it's she does extensive research, but it, I thought it was like one of the best books ever that talks about um, picture brides and from their perspective. This is just a, a really great photo of a, of a young family from the 19 teens. Um, as you can see, definitely not keeping their traditional dress, definitely doing the Western dress. This one, again, like I said, you saw that uh, 1914 passport. This is a place, an area out here in Scottsbluff called the Dutch Flats and the Sato Farm. And this is really fascinating because they came in early enough 
and they actually owned land. And if you look at the picture to your right, the woman there with the cap and the little kids next to her, keep her in mind because she's going to show up later on in these slides. So this kind of gives a, because the one thing when I was asking folks, it's like, well, how many folks were? I mean, how many Japanese were in this valley? So this kind of gives a rough idea. I mean, we're not talking in a rural setting like maybe a hundred. There was a decent population. Again, this is an article from Star Herald um, talking about, yes, they did have labor contractors that would go and, and, would round up the labor and have them come in and, and work with them. Again, more of the, the article. I did go through the newspapers to find out, you know, what what could I glean from, from this group? And the, so they did make the news and you can see how they were part of the community. Uh, this was another article, like I said, 1920, where they're going to start organizing and do their own social uh, socializing or social club. Um, mo even though most of the Japanese in here, I would say, were um, ag workers, there were a few that were businessmen, but that I've only come across maybe no more than five, but because most of them, like I said, did work in, uh, were farmers. So, but now that everything was great because there was anti-Asian sentiments, and I'm sorry, I misspelled that. Um, it started in 1882, as you can see from the Chinese Exclusion Act. A lot of this starts happening on the West Coast. Um, unfortunately, it's, well, the U.S. has been down through this path many times. Uh, there was this fear that they were going to take away jobs. So this, I've, what I'm present here is just a list of the of the different laws and acts from state and national. Now in 1918 that one is really interesting because it will have an effect on Nebraska laws. So that comes out in 24 federal law. So then Nebraska starts saying, no, we need our own law. And so this is an article from the Star Herald in 1920. Um, they were talking about this in Nebraska legislature about setting up their own uh, basically anti they, they couch it in another way, but basically it was to keep uh, Japanese Asians from owning land. Not a very great picture, but this is actually the bill that was presented. Um, basically, it denied the Japanese, once this bill passed, that they could own any land. Now, if you remember that one slide from the Satos in 1914, he, they were prosperous enough that they actually owned land. So when this law took effect, it did not, it didn't affect them. But all the other young men that came in, let's say during the teens, as they get them established, they could no longer purchase land. And so then they basically became rent farmers. Again, I found out this came out of the North Platte, uh, representative and I have not researched the, really but he was good friends with a representative from California and remember in 1918 they already had their uh, law stating that the Japanese or Asians cannot own land so it did show you that connection how it filtered into Nebraska because my question was why would this be any concern for Nebraskans well I think that is the tie right there So the law passed, and so basically what you're going to be seeing are photos from like the 1920s into the 30s. Again, I came across this. Somebody had it in their photo album. I thought it was a really good representation, Representation 1920s, a uh, father and his young son. Again, very Western dress, um, showing just, again, part of what life would have been like. 
the one thing that the Japanese did, they even though they, they had their own activities, uh, this hall right now was just moved. It is this structure served as a community hall for the Japanese in the valley, and it's more specifically in Scotts Bluff. There was another one, I believe, uh, in, in Mitchell. Uh, it was designed and built by the Japanese themselves. It is the only structure left in, in the state that is that was strictly, like I said, designed and built by the Japanese. And this hall is being saved right now and was moved off its foundations and at uh, Legacy of the Plains Museum here in Gary, Nebraska. Um, it's really interesting for those that are interested because it was designed by them and it was built for them. When I first went in there, um, because the Japanese were shorter, it, they were even shorter than myself. And so it was everything was built to their specs because most times you just go, well, it's just another building. No, not, not necessarily. That's, that was one of the unique things about this structure. Uh, this is a really good picture of a family, typical 1920s. Um, yes, they had large families, but they were no different from, from their, the rest of the, the families in the Valley or during the 1920s rural families. Yes, most families had five or more kids. As you can see by the girls' hairstyles and everything, I mean, there's just so many things you can read from this picture. But they typically had, yes, large families because a lot of them ended up being rent farmers. And of course, you know, kids, they're farmhands, right? Um, one of the uniqueness that I would ask, say, what made them different from, or, or how did they assimilate in? And so one of the things that would, separate them a little different than you had Germans from Russia, you had Germans also settling in the valley, and you also had Mexicans. They're all working in the sugar beet fields, onion fields, egg, up and down this valley. Um, they still, their parents, the Issei, still carried on the tradition of the Japanese bath. And I found that really fascinating. So they would move around a lot depending on if they ended up renting another farm, so they moved to that little farmhouse. And one family said yes. Every time they moved, that was one of the first things um, the kids did, help their parents, and they set up a Japanese bath. Um, some of you, I had, to, I had to ask them, well, what's a Japanese bath? Basically, you would, at the end of the day, you would wash up, wash your body, and then you would go into a very hot tub of water. Uh, I'm generalizing very much here. So the idea of at that time, people like only took a Saturday bath, uh, it did not go, no, they were not typical of that or their neighbors. Um, the other thing at this time, I asked, uh, and, and this is my own fault, I, I asked them, uh, because there was so many children, um, did they go to the hospital a lot? No. They pretty much did their own medicine. Rarely was a doctor called. And when you, and births happened at home. Uh, one woman, uh, Mikara, she, she, oh gosh, how big was her family? I think like 10 kids or something. And she just remembers the, the kids were all shoot out of the house. And then when they were allowed to come back in, ta-da, there was a little baby brother or baby sister, so. Um, next slide. This is another one I, I think is a really good example to show you of that time frame. I'm going to say probably mid 30s, just again by their styles. I mean, very much westernized. I mean, you know, this is the Nisei. This is the second generation that's going to be the bridge from their parents because most of them did not know English when they came into the United States. These kids attended school. Were they fluent in Japanese? No, most of the ones that I talked to, yes, they could understand their parents, but, and they still, you know, would use certain Japanese words. But again, they are that, that bridge that is typical amongst, you know, immigrant uh, families coming in or their children. This one I found out like at that um, community hall, they would hold these Japanese summer schools. And so, because where we're located, or where it's located, Denver is much closer than Lincoln. Denver's only about three hours away. Around the Front Range in Colorado, there was a fairly large 
population of Japanese and a lot of them were truck farmers. And so they would bring in instructors to, sh to basically teach the kids. Uh, they said sometimes they taught them martial arts. They would try to teach, um, you know, the, the language, keep some of their culture alive. And I asked one, uh, when they say, and he's, you know, they have fond memories of it, but basically said it was mainly just a break from working in the fields and they could socialize with each other. This is just, I love this picture. This is, uh, this is Sakurata girls. Um, as you can see, they're just having a great time. I mean, they're just, you know, they're part of the community. This is probably late 19, late 1930s, possibly early 40s. So uh, the reason I show this picture is because some of them, the Japanese were known, or what I was told, they were very good farmers. And so those landowners would buy or try to get the Japanese to farm, to, to rent farm from them. And so this house on the left is the Sakurata farmhouse. And so, let's see, how many kids do they have? Uh, about, oh gosh, I think nine kids maybe. And you can see it's a pretty small house, but how prosperous it was because they actually had a hired man. And it was a Mexican family that would come in seasonal and come and work for them. So I thought that was really interesting because they couldn't own land, but yet they were highly sought after to, to work farm, to be rent farmers. But then yet they could also then hire other families to help them out. Now, the reason I brought this one up, Father Cano, he is really... Um, he came from pretty high status Japanese family. He came to Nebraska. He actually, William Jenny Bryan, uh, he got his degrees in agriculture uh, from University of Nebraska Lincoln. He, owned, he had a farm in the more central part and then he ended up into the North Platte Valley area. Eventually he would become an Episcopal priest. Uh, he really was the record hold, um, the recorder of the Japanese history in this valley. So thanks to him and his meticulous record keeping, this is the stats. Because again, I was always wondering how many, how many Japanese were in that valley area. So then, Everything's going great until December 7th, 1941. And that's when everything's going to change for them. So when that happened, and I did, I asked him. I said, okay, I'm going to have to ask you about World War II. So when Pearl Harbor happened, they did, FBI, law enforcement did come. Father Connell was the only one that, it, that I was, since he was, quote, deemed the leader, um, he did get arrested and he is the only one that ended up being in an internment camp. The rest were allowed to go return to their farms and to their homes, but this is what they all told me. Uh, and remember, these Nisei are, a lot of them are young kids, young kids in high school at this time. So they remember their radios were confiscated, all firearms, their cameras, um, their, anything ceremonial, uh, as I was talking to them later on, it was just in passing I heard this, and I found out that some of the families, as I wrote there, chose to burn or bury their belongings because when I would go into their homes, I didn't see a lot of the Nisei in their homes now. I don't see a lot of stuff that, you know, a lot of families will, heirlooms and stuff like that, they'll have. And when I found this out, that made sense. Um, they were restricted. Uh, yeah, they had to carry permit and they were limited 50 miles to travel. If they had to go any further, they had to let authorities know and give reason why. So one of the women, um, the, one of the Nisei, uh, they had this, um, from their mother-in-law 
and I, because I, I said, well, what did it look like? And so what you're seeing now is the card that they all had to, to carry with them. I will say right now that um, most of the Japanese were not, almost all of them except for Father, Con Father Kano, did not have to go into the camps. And this is the one thing, because I remember as a kid, and maybe I missed it, but it was like, I thought all Japanese had were, were put in camps. No, it was just the ones on the West Coast. And then as I was talking to them, this is what is just, it's really messed up. They could, you know, on their farms, if they had family members that were living in the West Coast that were put in the camps, they could request for their family members to come out of the camps and live with them and help them on the farm. I don't know. For me, it just struck me as just that's really messed up. So how did the citizens and their neighbors react to the Japanese neighbors? So this is what I found. Um, when I first did the research, uh, I talked to a gentleman. His dad was actually, I think, president of the Mitchell Bank. And he was very supportive of the Japanese. The FBI wanted to come in and clo immediately, clo immediately close all the Japanese accounts. Well, he said, no, that you would break them. I mean, you can't do that. And he really fought for him. And he stood up to the FBI and they did not mess with their accounts. Um, I think there probably was maybe certainly some name calling, that type of derogatory term, um, but outright acts of violence and going and beating them up. No, I've not heard of that. I will say most of them are, the Nisei are still incredibly reticent to talk about that. Um, but because they have been, because they had been in that valley for so long and it's rural and they were such good farmers, and they were model citizens. I think that also helped. And I almost view it as in some ways perhaps that they maybe didn't get that much harassed by the locos. It's maybe the one, the quote, outsiders coming into the valley. But um, yeah, they suffered. Um, certainly they, they didn't congregate anymore. I know they didn't hold, uh, church services. I believe they didn't go to their community halls, that type of thing. Um, again, another picture of father Connell, like I said, he is the one that, uh, ended up being arrested and going sent away to a camp. Now, the reason I have this picture is because, like I said, he was a meticulous record keeper, wonderful penmanship, and this was his entry on Pearl Harbor. Now, notice the shaky handwriting. Next one. And then this is his typical handwriting. And for me, I don't know, it just struck me when I saw that. It was like, okay, obviously, that's all he put as an entry for that date and that obviously he was sh shaken up. I mean, um, but as represented by his, his handwriting there. Um, okay, go ahead. Now, the reason I put this in, because it's a propaganda thing for grow more sugar beets. So it's like, why weren't they in the camps, blah, blah, blah. It's because sugar beets and sugar, and we know sugar was rationed. So it is a, a top priority, a commodity. And so you needed them. So they basically became essential workers, even though they confiscated a lot of items from them. But they were deemed in part of the war effort. Um, so that's why I wanted to just really stress that because that's one thing that came apparent um, with everything else going on, but they needed their labor and their expertise to grow the crop. Now, for those that maybe aren't familiar or are, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, this was basically made up uh, the sons of these Issei. And they were one of the most highly decorated regiments or the most decorated one. 
as you can see by their honors or the medals. So yes, the majority of Japanese or the Nisei, the young men, did not fight in. Um, there, I do have a couple of books. I haven't researched it that much, but there were some that were in intelligence and were doing, I'm not going to say code breaking, but they were in part of that, but it was a very, very small group. But the majority of the ones that did join the army, and some of them were already in the army before Pearl Harbor, before World War II, because uh, lack of jobs, whatever, this is not unusual if you join like, let's say 1938 or 39, even 1940. Anyway, but the 442nd, most of them, or Basically, they're in the European theater. Now, again, this is from Father Connell uh, because he kept really good records. These are all the young men that were sons of these Issei that were in the valley. And then Central would be more like North Platte and more in the central part of the state. We did have some women, a young women that ended up being in the uh, Army Nurse Cadet Corps. So after the war, um, in 52, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. There's 1952, the McCarran-Walter Act. And so basically that rescinded this stupid uh, immigration policy thing in 1924. And it basically allowed, if you were good and upstanding citizen, uh, basically, uh, and it was applied intent was for the Asians, that they could become US citizens. And then you could apply for naturalization. And so, Remember these Issei now, they're now in their 50s, 60s, and they are having to go through immigration uh, naturalization classes. And remember that young woman in that, if you remember in that photo from 1914, this is her and this is her naturalization uh, certificate. And this is her husband. This was a naturalization uh, ceremony, I believe either, in, I think it was North Platte. Father Cano is on the back row on the far left. Again, he's the one that helped a lot of them um, study for the test. Remember, as you can see, uh, the folks in there, most of them are, again, like I said, in their 50s, 60s, uh, remember these folks when they came over, majority of them did not know English. So the reason I threw this picture in, even though the war is over, we still have national service. And so I thought that this is just a great picture. Uh, the guy on the right is Nick Sakurata. He had two older brothers that served in the 442nd. Uh, he is doing his time his two to what, three year stint in national service in the army. And there he is with one of his army pals. And so as I'm learning about him and I was talking to some of them, one always said, yeah, we always kind of like to fly under the radar. I said, radar. And I said, well, you're no longer under the radar anymore. And so when I was doing research, it was, not much has been written about them. In 76, this was a book that was produced on the different ethnicities in Nebraska. And then the Nebraska history in 2002, somebody did an article on that and it was actually University of Nebraska Lincoln along with three other universities that allowed some Nisei to leave the camps and attend university during the war years. The other person, Ben Karoki, he actually published a book shortly after his service. He was a gunner uh, and a bomber. Uh, he actually flew not only European, but also Pacific theater um, jobs. And then in 2014, McCarr came out. This is the first one ever on 
contributions by the Nisei, talking about their parents that uh, came into the valley. And then in 2010, the Nikkei Farmer, this is actually uh, manuscripts and diaries and letters of Father Kano. And then I have uh, two, three colleagues when I was at K-State, uh, Jeff Nelson and Troy Elkins, and at the time, Hannah uh, Marsh, she was working at the, uh, at the Eisenhower and they were doing their World War II exhibit. I was telling them about it. And so they made this display or uh, info panel. Now these are the Nisei now. This is probably about uh, six years ago, as you can see. The group of ladies, they had their own club. That was Makara. I got a lot of good information from her. She is still around. And there's Nancy Sato. And it, she's on her farm that was still in the family. And then um, I worked with a producer with uh, Nebraska Education TV or a public radio, uh, public TV. And they did a nice little video documentary on uh, the Japanese in Western Nebraska titled Visible People. And so if you're interested in watching that, you can just uh, YouTube Nebraska Stories, Visible People, and you can watch it. it goes a little more in depth. All right, thank you so much, Sandra. Um, at this time, I am opening up the floor for questions. Um, so if you have a question, you can type it in the chat and discuss. Um, I see Dorinda has a question. She has her hand. I'll go ahead and Dorinda, if you can, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. First of all, thank you for this information. Um, I, it's brand new to me and it's fascinating. So of the 500 or so that in the early years, how many are now left in the Nebraska area or, and are they like so many kids they want to leave and go elsewhere. So how many are left of the original families? Well, you know, that's a good question because I asked them the same thing. And they they mirror typical what's happening in rural America. And so a lot of them never went into agriculture. So that Nisei group is probably, I'm gonna say probably no more than 50. Okay. Most of their children, the the Sanse are 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 not, because I said that bridge, and when they're the Nisei had children, almost one they didn't have as many children. Two, they almost almost all of them have college education, and they did not take up into the ag field. And so again, typical, they would move out, they'd go to Lincoln, Denver, maybe Chicago, someplace else. So in some ways they very much mirror rural America. Do you know how many of them joined the 442nd? Uh, I'd have to go through that list that it was a slide. It was, it was actually quite a large number that, that were in, in service. Okay. Uh, was it maybe, I don't know, that list was at least, what, 50 maybe? Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, Don, I saw your hand up. Well, I always go back to Dwight Eisenhower, right? And was there any sort of situation, I know you studied Nebraska, so you might not be able to answer this um, directly, but maybe theoretically. Um, did, did we have any sort of uh, Japanese um, um, communities in Kansas that you know of? Was there any sort of a, a marginal connection to the Eisenhowers at all? 
I'm going to say no. I didn't find. I looked at Kansas since at the time I was living there, Nebraska, and I looked at South Dakota. And I think for the region in every the region in western Kansas, why they didn't flow from eastern Colorado into western Kansas area, yeah. it was because of large uh, dry land farming. There wasn't irrigation. Um, when I looked at uh, South Dakota, because of the Black Hills, and also I looked, found the, I call it the smoking gun letter from uh, the bishop from the Episcopal Church. He was not encouraging Japanese to come into South Dakota because he wanted to keep them in Japan so they could proselytize and, and, and do, yeah, I'm talking from the Episcopal standpoint. So there was never any that support. And I really think why they come into Nebraska it's because of the irrigation and the sugar beets and the railroad and dump them in right in that long valley. It, does that answer you? But no, I did look at, at Kansas and I was like, well, how come? And I think that was a large part because of geographically in topography. Thank you. Sure. Um, from the Central Territory Museum, we have, um, are there any connections between the Japanese community in Nebraska and Colorado through the sugar beet industry? Yes, very much so. And there's a much more large population. Um, one of the questions I had to ask, or I, I asked, but I had to like really be careful how I asked, as you have a rural community, everybody kind of intermarries. Well, there was no really intermarrying between Japanese and whites at this time. So my question was, okay, so you had the picture brides and then they stopped the picture brides from coming in. Where are basically you finding wives? They would go into the Denver area. So then there's that tie. And certainly the Nisei, I know when I started, in, uh, when I was interviewing them, a lot of them, they, you know, they make the trip down to Colorado and, and mix with that. Also, I found out, I said, you know, during the teens and 20s and 30s, I said, look, you eat rice, you got your, your Japanese food, where are you getting this stuff? Well, there was a dry goods store, but they also told me there was a truck that would be loaded with Japanese food that would come up into the area and sell to the families. All right. Um, John Wood, I see you just joined back in with us and you had your hand up before do you still have a question you're, you're muted sir um i wanted if, to know if you would share your personal background and history with us if that was okay uh gosh i don't know <laughs> growing up i was always i liked history i mean in nebraska it was always about the pioneers and so that was it. I just never thought history was a viable <laughs> occupation. Or and so I came to it late in life. Um, actually, I worked down at Boeing for for many years and uh, started taking night classes. And then it's like, well, all I do is read history. And so they said, yeah, you can get your history degree, your master's in the evenings. I said, okay. And so that's how I got started in the history field. Does that answer your question? And so are you a descendant of the original uh, Issei and Nisei? No, I am not uh, Japanese, I'm Korean. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mr. Wood, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Uh, I was curious if the population of Japanese Americans has decreased since uh, so many Japanese Americans of the Issei and following, or Nisei and following generations haven't taken up farming. The Japanese population of Nebraska. Oh, I see. Um, that I'm not sure. I'm, I can only just speak from the western part of the state. Now, I, I there there were some. There are a few <clears throat> folks doing some research that in Lincoln and Omaha. Uh, I think some of them were used as strike breakers. You had uh, the packing plant. Uh, you had businesses and and I think packing houses on the in the eastern part of the state. But like I said, that I'm not certain of because, like I said, I focus mainly just on the western part of, or into the panhandle. 
And um, then I'm curious about the, the the father. I think his name was Kano, the Episcopal priest. Yes. So was that yes. a, an exclusively Japanese American church? Um, he was a, a they had their own service. I think, yeah. I mean, one of the churches is still here in Mitchell, Nebraska. Um, yeah. So does it survive as a largely Japanese American church? I'm sorry, what? Does it survive as a largely Japanese American no, church? No, no, it doesn't. I mean, the church name Holy Apostles and, and anybody, you know, it's, it's not. Because, again, by the 1960s and definitely when the Nisei started having their children and they became an age, so they're going into college. You know, they're baby boomers, so they're basically going into college in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, and moving on. Um, I, there's one thing I, I don't know if you may find interesting. I did ask some of the Nisei, I said, what, what was your reaction to dropping the bomb? And a lot of, there were some of them that came from Hir Hiroshima, from that prefecture, and so I remember the one story Ted Hara told me that uh, he was in national service. He was in the army. He was stationed um, in Korea. This, was, this would have been early 50s. And he actually took leave and he went over and he located his dad's sister. And uh, he couldn't speak any Japanese. They couldn't speak any English, but, you know, they welcomed him, and he got to meet his cousins. And, yes, they, they carried still terrible scars from the dropping. But he felt there was no animosity. They didn't hate Americans or anything like that. Um, most of the reaction, when I did ask them, they would have been in high school when the bomb dropped, a lot of them. And they were, like everybody else, just shocked when, when the news broke about the bomb. All right, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, anyone on the phone, if you have a question, um, press star six to unmute. If it doesn't work the first time, try it again. I do see there's still a hand up. We'll I'll come back to you, um, Sandra and Dorinda, just. All right, well, we'll uh, come back to you, Sandra. And, and ask uh, <clears throat> kind of a supportive comment. I can't remember the name of it. An American author, Sandra Dallas, has written a book about the Japanese on the beet farms. <clears throat> I think it's in eastern Colorado, mm -hmm. and not so much western Nebraska, but it's very much the same story that you're telling of the Japanese working in the beet farms and support and prejudice from the small town in Colorado. Again, the author is Sandra Dallas. Huh. I do not remember the name of the book. I'm trying. No, thank you. Uh, actually, when I was doing my research, most of the information that I did find actually came from ag journals because mm -hmm. that's what they were, and that's where you would, they would actually write some articles about the Japanese, Germans from Russia, child labor, and the Mexicans because they were working in those beet fields, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this one is fiction, of course, but still. Sure. Forty story. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. A comic question from Central Territory Museum it says agricultural journals in Brighton, Colorado. I'm not sure what that means, but maybe you do. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. It says agricultural journals in Brighton, Colorado. Or at least that's what I think AG stands for. Right. <laughs> I mean, if anybody, I mean, I encourage, I, this area still needs a lot more research then. I mean, I just barely scratched the surface. Uh, but yeah, in, in fact, finding uh, repositories that uh, actually have documentation, and that was another thing. Finding documentation, first person, you know, primary sources is really difficult. Um, so you have to go through the, like the Great Western Sugar Company through their records um, that type of thing. Because again, um, if they did keep journals, if they did keep anything, I think they were destroyed because of the confiscation and that type of thing during the war. 
and they were of a they were of a generation that they didn't really talk about a lot of stuff with their kids. All right, uh, Don, you have a question. Sure. So, um, uh, in America, we sort of have this um, history of immigrant um, communities coming in. Um, then totally assimilating and, and becoming American and losing that um, cultural heritage from wherever the wherever they came from originally. And then eventually there's some sort of a push to reclaim um, any sort of cultural heritage um, that's particularly important for that for that group of people. Where is this group at on this sort of um, spectrum that I just imagined more than anything else? I don't think, I think they, they, they honor their history, but you're not going to see like big Japanese festival out here. Let's put it that way. Um, the one thing that uh, struck me was obviously like in every culture is the importance of food. And so when I'm at dinner with the, some of the Nisei, they still, like I said, uh, they, they always have a thing of rice. So I asked some of the sansei. I said, "So, do you guys keep in that tradition?" And most of them are like, "No, very few." And there's only one or two I think still enjoy, you know, knows how to make sushi. Not sashimi, sushi. But majority of them, no. I mean, they're I don't know how she, you know, th yeah, completely assimilate. Completely. Did you find any evidence of any uh, Buddhist churches or temples? Yes, there, yes, there was uh, Christian and there was Buddhist. And in that community hall, uh, that eventually ended up being a Buddhist temple. And so they showed me that there was a little side door by the stage door that would have the the accoutrements for it. But they would have, um, oh, what do you call it? He was like itinerant. He, he would like travel around and he'd come out of Denver, but it wasn't like services all the time. I see. And there are some that I think still adhere to, Buddha, to the Buddhist church, but the majority were Episcopalians. There were some Methodists. And then, of course, then you had a section that was Buddhist. Hmm. Okay, the Central Territory Museum made a comment. Uh, that Brighton, Colorado has a very large Japanese newspaper collection. Oh, okay. Now, though, I was told that during the 19 teens, there was a Japanese newspaper, but as far as anybody knows, nobody has ever turned up a copy of it, or if, if any ever exists, uh, you know, still exists. Hmm. All right, are there any other questions? Any questions from the phone? No, Sandra, you have a question? Yes, um, you're talking about whether the, the Nisi and their descendants are keeping up with the cultures and the foods and all. What about language? Is there any attempt to pass on or to relearn the Japanese language? I think that's up to them individually, the sansei or the yonsei, which would be their children. Um, and their children would probably be now, what, in their 30s? Yeah, in the 30s, 40s. No, I mean, they still, you know, they will refer to, like, maybe some food items or something with the Japanese name. But, yeah, full-blown learning the language, no. All right, thank you, Sandra. Um, we are going to wrap up. Uh, today's program is sponsored by the Eisenhower Foundation with generous support from the Jeff Coe Foundation. We, we would love for you to join us uh, for our next, for our upcoming programs um, on Thursday. April 22nd at noon Central. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Shelley Klein as our guest speaker during our Learn to Learn program. She is with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education and, 
and will talk to us about the rise of the Nazi party and propaganda. And then we have our next book club chat on Tuesday, May 11th at 7 p.m. Central. Our book this month is not, our, our book for that month is not without laughter, violence, and hues. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great afternoon, and we will see you at our next program. <laughs>